Raising Unicorns! Harmon Brothers! All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Raising Unicorns. I have the one and only, the legend, the man, the myth. All right. It's not the right order. Go easy. <laughs> the man, Go. the myth, the legend. Brett freaking Crockett. It's time to chat with the legend. That's legendary. I started by building funnels. I think the first project I worked on with Harmon Brothers was Purple and uh, started on that project right at the logo design. So Daniel and I were working together on that. And uh, and it was a ton of fun. Which to is build. really cool. Because yeah. Brett has his logo design. You, you helped with it, right? With Daniel? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. The logo design, uh, the purple still uses. And uh, we also have a design patent on the original mattress cover and stuff like that. Um, it was a ton of fun primarily. So I did some logo design there, but also uh, kind of my my uh, primary responsibility was creating the funnels so that once somebody saw one of our amazing ads, um, they would land on a page that would eventually lead to conversion. And so it was, what's the customer experience um, there all the way through purchase? And uh, and that's what we really focused on. I mean, we were, um, I remember late nights, you know, Jeffrey Harmon and Benton and and... Everybody really from Harmon Brothers kind of getting on the phone and it would be midnight and I get a phone call and we'd go to work on testing some different idea that we had for the landing page and uh, or wherever it was in the funnel to increase those conversions. And so it was super exciting. Um, not many hours of sleep during those during those days. Uh, our campaign launches uh, were always just crazy all hands on deck. And they're to that way um, sometimes still, but I think we've worked out a process that has eliminated a lot of those all-nighters that we used to have, right? So we've come a long ways in that respect. Uh, grown the team and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, tons of fun, tons of stress and uh, loved every minute of it. But um, I think I think the main takeaway from that is just that we always had our eyes on what was going on with the ads and on the landing page everywhere from uh, what are the view rates, you know, where where's the retention curve and that kind of stuff. What do we need to tweak uh, down through, you know, how many people are purchasing this out the end of this funnel and what do we need to change throughout that thing to make sure that we get more people buying. So that's just been kind of the DNA of Harmon Brothers from the start. And uh, and I think that's one of the things that maybe makes us a little bit different is we're excess, obsessed with that data and uh, and just continually improving that thing so that, that the ads continue to perform. But it's it's that's the fun stuff in my opinion. Because I mean, some of the campaigns just came out like cranking, like with the original, like yeah. with purple, like you guys kind of nailed that one pretty out the gate. I know there was optimizations that went mm -hmm. along that made it even better, but I know that on purple, we were very profitable mm -hmm. out the gate. You know, once we got through the initial video testing period, they were, you know, getting, you know, mattress acquisitions for, you know, 20% of the cost of the, you know, basket size. So it was like instantly yeah. you're hitting a five to one, you know, yeah. return on investment or, or you know, ROAS. Mm -hmm. But I know there's been other ones that was like, there were more challenging where we had to kind of grind away at it. And I wonder if you'd speak a little bit about that, like specifically like fiber fix. I remember one that yeah. we worked tirelessly because that one's a weird one. I'll give a little bit of context to the audience because the fiber Fix video that we did had you know this bombastic opening where we took a car wrapped it up in a we basically made a roll cage out of it one was held together by duct tape one was held together by fiber fix and we showcased and like showcased the difference of performance of the roll cages the duct yeah. tape one versus the fiber fix one and we chucked it off a giant cliff down a, a you know a gravel quarry <laughs> and it was you yeah. know it was pretty visual big demonstration that was pretty cool and when we released that initial video it went bonkers i think it got 17 million views in the first you know 24 hours yeah and then it's one of those weird mysteries of the internet it just evaporated it disappeared overnight all links to it all tagging in it all messages with it in it on facebook just literally vanished instantly yeah yep totally disappeared and because we were when it was when it actually was organically viral there was a, a good amount of sales that were coming in organically because we weren't having to pay for those views, right? And so right. it was looked like a success in the first 24 hours. Like, oh, it's going to do it again. It's going to be amazing. It's going to crank. And then when we re-uploaded the video, it didn't have that same viral coefficient. That video really struggled to sell, right? Yeah, 
Yep, it did. And then I think that's when the work for Hiram Brothers really started. And um, I could speak a little bit to the video side of things, Brett, um, uh, before I hand it off to you on the but the funnel side. But I remember we went back and we refilmed a whole new video mm -hmm. um, where we refocused it on saving time and money rather than Saturday saved was kind of the the tagline of the first video. It was like, oh yeah, you have fiber fix Saturday saved, you know. But like we were like we were saving you time and money, and we were literally like burned money. Yeah. Um. On the, on the intro, which was a really catchy intro. So we got the vi we got the video to perform better on like the view through rates, the click through rates, and engagement. And then I want you to talk a little bit about like the challenge of the back end on the sale for the the funnel and all the different iterations and all the testing we went through to get that one to work. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, an exciting campaign to work on and many late nights. Like I remember that one specifically uh, because we were all freaking out. Like, where did the video go? And interesting thing is, after we launched the second video, and I don't know how long it was afterwards, but eventually the video mysteriously reappeared. Oh, it was like account. a full year. Was it a year? It was a later? full year. Yeah. Yeah. The, cra the crazy thing, though, is all the comments, all the shares repopulated, mm -hmm. all the like views were back. It's like yeah. it got like popped like we think it got like mer or purged in like a data you know like set that was transferred from one data set to the other and it got purged somehow and then they went yeah. back in a backup and like refound it or something it was and facebook was like no nah, yeah sucks to you guys. <laughs> yeah exactly like, <laughs> they were as helpful back then as they are today you know nothing we could do about that sort of thing but like you said um we did everything we could on our side um to to try and make things work again and to your point one of those was just constant optimization so i think i probably worked on landing pages uh, and different pieces of the funnel for that campaign for several mm -hmm. years after it launched, right? Right up until Fiberfix was acquired, I think. We were still working on uh, revisions mm -hmm. and trying to increase optimization or uh, increase conversion rate, that, that kind of thing. Um, so it was a ton of fun, ton of experience. I think um, one of the main things that we were we were trying to figure out was how do we get people so uh, a roll of fiber fix i think it was seven or eight bucks or something like that yeah and Very um, cheap. not enough to to cover cost of acquisition right and so we did a lot of testing around packages um to the point where we even built like a uh, a fiber fix bag that was like a tool bag that had all the different products in it. And I think, you know, price point on that was like 150 bucks or something like that. So we were doing everything we could to not only increase the conversion rate on the page, but increase the average order value and doing that by selling multiple roles and different like associated products and stuff like that. And I think one of the big learnings from that was just how important the offer is, right? In the video itself, we talk about how amazing the product is and it really is fiber fixes. In fact, my wife the other day asked me, she's like, do we have any fiber fix? And I was like, oh man, the stuff we have is expired. <laughs> um, Cause it does, that's one of the, one of the things is they've got to sell through the product because there is an expiry date. I don't know if it's five years or something like that. But in any case, um, what we realized was, hey, you can you can talk about how and show how amazing the product is, um, but you also have to have an amazing offer. And I think that's what we ended up finding success with. We got uh, Russell Brunson on board helping us. In fact, I think that Fiberfix campaign is when we first started using ClickFunnels. And if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. um, Russell basically took the landing pages that I had built and said, to heck with these, and built his own in ClickFunnels. <laughs> and we transferred things over into there. And, uh, and he helped us with a bunch of the offers. And then we started using ClickFunnels for Fiberfix and several other clients from mm -hmm. that point forward. Um, but again, it was like, how do we get people to not only purchase this product, how do we get them to purchase enough of this product that we can cover the cost per acquisition and then we can make some some money on the back end. And uh, it was just a, a fun experience to try all those different things, different packages, and then how you present that offer also matters, right? So there's like the yeah. three pieces um, and they all have to be aligned to to make those sales and make the campaign successful. So that's uh, that's that was a long process of learning, but I think invaluable for us at Harmon Brothers. We still use all those lessons today. Yeah, that was one of the things that I would I'd say was a lesson because like I I remember like in marketing, you know, in in in, mar in school like in marketing classes they'd be like, oh, you don't want to do too many SKUs because it's hard to manage too many SKUs, which is I mean I think it's true to manage a too big of a library, but also I think one of the lessons I took away from Fiberfix is if you have some of those other things that have 
low cost of goods sold and also add value like especially if you have a skew that's really low in cost like a, like a fiber fix like you've got to create bundles because yeah. it's almost impossible like you said Brett to get a positive ROAS on Facebook when your average order value is 10 bucks. Yeah. Like that's really hard. When I talk to companies in the business development side of Harm, but people that reach out to us, I think that's one of the biggest things they miss out on is making sure that they have the right value and they have the right offer, um, tested through and, you know, they've increased or they, they've really figured out how to increase their average order value to where they can compete on Facebook. Cause that's like something that, uh, I think, um, historically, if you look at, you know, purple and you look at fiber fix, especially, and you look at squatty potty, there was, there was, oh, and it's not, it wasn't as big as I say fiber fix was probably the one that was the most complicated and had the most components, Yeah, but like purple, we we're still trying to sell sheets. We were still trying to sell pillows. We we're still trying to sell the seat cushions. Like we were like, yep. we had all those things that we recorded when we did the original videos. So we had those as options that we could throw in, in the funnel, um, if for offers and different bundles. Because I think that that's, you know, that is at the core of how you can outcompete people. I think people always believe it's like, oh, they just make a really funny video and they get free <laughs> video views. That's their strategy. Yeah, yeah. And every time I hear that, I want to punch them in the nose and be like, <laughs> If it were that easy, like anyone would do it, right? Yeah. Like and it's not easy to get a viral video, but like there's a lot more grinding it out um, in the background that people don't realize went into these big campaigns. Yeah, that's right. I, I think, I mean, humor has always been something that we've leaned on because it makes subjects approachable and that kind of thing. And it's an important component for nearly every video that for we sure. create. But, uh, but if you don't have the offer, like people are going to watch the video and they're going to laugh and then they're not going to purchase. So, um, yeah, I, or, I think or those even are all good points. maybe they will purchase, but there's not enough value in their purchase to fuel the ad spend. Well, right? yeah. And that's, that's the problem is you end up giving all of your profit to Zuckerberg and you're left with nothing. So you basically work exactly. for that guy and uh, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah, the, 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 you know, whether it's through bundling or upsells, cross sells, that order bumps, that kind of stuff, um, you have to be thinking about every piece of that because if you miss it, you're not going to have a successful campaign. Like you just, your offer is not your price. You're not just going to say, oh, we're, we're going to mm -hmm. run a sale or we're going to discount this thing. And that's what's going to make your campaign successful. That is that is like the very last mm -hmm. thing you need to think about is, is kind of those things. It's like you've got to get all the pieces lined up and then you can talk about, OK, so what should the we already you know what the pricing should be. What you need to be focused on is what the offer is. And that's where you really right. can get creative. We're still working with companies and helping them with these funnels. In fact, we're doing this more now than we probably have, you know, since those early campaigns um, and really working with them to crack the code on their offer, on their price point and handling their media buying as well as the media creation. And I think one of the things that still remains the same across now and then is knowing what variables you can test and testing those things and putting tests in motion and convincing clients that testing, even though it's expensive, is the way to get gains that's actually going to move the needle in the long term, right? Because that's yeah. like, there's like a testing paralysis, I think, that people do fall into where they're like, oh, well, but testing is like expensive and risky because like we don't know if it's going to work. And, but we do know these old ads work at some level and have some level of reliability. And I think even now more than ever, there's a disposability to content on Facebook where you churn through so much that you are forced to test, um, at least on the content side, way more frequently than you used to have to test mm -hmm. and put way more volume through it. So I think that that like testing overall across everything, testing your, f your content that you're making, testing your, uh, actual offer and testing your funnel out, meaning like the actual click rate optimization side of like, are you, is your, are your reviews prominent enough? Do you have like your bundles clear and your offering clear? Are your, is your image carousel the right image carousel? Is it conveying the value plot props of the product in a clear way? Um, is everything above the fold on mobile? Like these, there's all these lists of things that we know has to be done that like all those things have stayed completely constant since the we started working in this 10 years ago, right? And the main thing that has changed is the algorithms 
and the fact that it's become much more pay to play than it was in the early days, which means that the pieces that we're talking about are even more important than they ever were back yep. then. And so that's why I think Harm Brothers has this advantage where we grew up like testing this stuff, testing thumbnail images, testing headlines, testing body copy, um, you know, the message testing that we do, the landing page optimization, like all that kind of stuff. We've always done it. And, uh, and it, it produced great results back then. And it produces, I would say, like it, it saves campaigns from dying on the vine today. Like back then, mm -hmm. if, if we didn't get it right with Purple, and we probably didn't, right? Like I guarantee that the landing pages that Purple has today are better than landing pages that I designed back then. Um, sure. Th the reality is like there was enough play because we had virality and stuff like that, that we could still be successful if we didn't nail every piece of it. But today, I, honestly, like if you're not, if you're not constantly testing and improving, I don't see how you can be successful, honestly. And it's funny because mm -hmm. I'm working on a project right now um, with a company that has, I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars and I'm suggesting tests that we should be running, right? Like they're running tests and stuff, but what we try to do is democratize the, the process of testing because one of Harmon Brothers, uh, what's the word idioms or something that we say, like uh, almost a model maxim. of Harm, yeah, maxim is that, um, uh, good ideas can come from anywhere. And so mm -hmm. the more ideas that we have, the more we can test, like the better we're going to be. And we always also say that as long as you're testing, you're never wasting money. You, and you have to look at testing as an opportunity rather than a cost. Mm -hmm. Because if you continue to run what you've always ran and you're not testing and pushing the bounds on testing, your ads will suffer from attrition and suffer from loss of performance over time. And that's going to have real meaningful costs to the business yep. um, that can have real like dire consequences on, you know, your PL um, that might be hard to get out of. But if you're constantly, you know, it might cost you, if you're looking at like revenue or profitability, you might have a dip while you do a test. But if that yields a positive result, you're going to end up higher than where you were and you can, you know, recover the, those, those, that cost the yeah, by the, the performance testing. that you yeah. get. Yeah. By unlocking that performance and not all tests are going to yield positive results, but it, the, you know, if you're testing the right way and the things that you're chasing after are big enough differences in tests, like and your, your big swings in like variability of types of creative variability and types of messaging and angles of attack you're going after are different enough. They're going to yield better results if you're doing it right. And I think that that's like how you have to think about it. Am I, and, and in Brooke's course that she's releasing um, this, this fall, like she talks about that. Like there's some things like some people think it's like, Oh, just change the text, but keep the image all the same. It's like, no, like that's not going to be enough. Like that's going to get lost in the noise of Facebook scrolling and people's, you mm -hmm. know, 0.25 seconds of determining whether this content's relevant to them. If they've seen that ad before yeah, and the, the copy is the only thing different, it's not going to stop them. <laughs> but if <laughs> yeah. they see something's completely different visually, it's striking or is totally it presented information in a way that they haven't seen, even if it's the same product, yeah. they're going to, it's going to stop them. Right. So making sure the levers you're pulling, are you pulling on those levers hard enough to make a big enough difference? Um, that's the, that's the big thing is like, if you are, you will get test results that will pay for themselves and the testing cost. Right. One of the things that's so great about Brooke's course that, that we've mentioned a couple of times is that she's approaching the the campaign from an ad buyer's perspective you're approaching it from a ceo or a creative director's standpoint and i'm mm -hmm. approaching it from like a landing page conversion rate optimization type standpoint right and so mm -hmm. having um you know having that insight from people who have different roles again this idea that good ideas can come from anywhere looking at things from an ad buyer's perspective will give the creative team completely different ideas, send them in a completely di yeah. direction than they may otherwise have taken things. And that's where, that's where this idea of like democratizing the testing, democratizing the ide ideation phase, all that kind of stuff and figuring out like, okay, so we have this great idea for a campaign. We know all this stuff about a product. Let's go and create a campaign. Oh, but wait, maybe we need the input of the person who's going to be buying ads on this because they know it's going to yeah. get that stuff thumb stop ratio or whatever it is. Right. And so that's why I think that this, this course is just like a fantastic way for creatives, 
for landing page people, like for anybody in an agency to take a step back, look at it from another perspective and say, oh, you know what? Everything we're creating has to be uh, kind of, um, has, has to agree with what's going on on the social networks mm -hmm. or the platforms that we're going to be placing these ads on. So don't leave that side out of the creative process because if we do that, we're very likely to miss on the ad. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's just like, a gold mine that we're uncovering by unlocking the brain of an ad buyer to help inform your creative. Bam, yeah, for mic sure. drop. And, but that, that cross pollination of disciplines and communication between disciplines, I think is where you get more creative and you get more brainstorming ideas. Like you said, good ideas coming from anywhere because you yeah. can get too close to your part of the, of the, of the funnel, your part of the content. And I think that that's really important to look at it and get different perspectives from different disciplines because that will unlock more ideas that will unlock uh, more potential that I think you typically um, will find by yourself in a silo. Yeah. And I think we're, we're seeing that with on some of our partnerships that we have, we're taking over the full, I mean, we're basically becoming on a couple of these partnerships that we have with companies. We're almost like their entire marketing arm, you mm -hmm. know, where we're managing everything except for like fulfillment and maybe email sequencing, but like all the top mm -hmm. of funnel, all the paid media, like we're handling so much of that uh, from top to bottom landing page, offer testing. Like we're, if we're not handling it directly, we're, we're directing their team on how to do it. And right. I think that that's like, uh, it's so important to talk to each other and hear each other's ideas because that's really where some magic happens and where you can unlock potential uh, upside, um, that you might not otherwise see if you just kind of stay in your silos. Cause we've, we've there's been times in Harm Brothers a history where we did not do the funnel. We did not yeah. do ad buying. Yeah. We just made the content. And I would say the hit rate on those campaigns when we weren't involved in a deeper level and they didn't have a really solid team uh, was, was a fraction of what it was of why, when either we took over the full funnel or when they have a really good team, we could trust. It's an important lesson to learn uh, that like at each part of the marketing uh, funnel, not just the content is critical. It's yeah. like, it's kind of like a domino, right? If you pull out one of those dominoes and things aren't falling down, it will stop. Yeah. It will stop and it will hurt you, you know? Yeah. Well, cool, Brad. This was so fun, man. This is like, that was a trip down memory lane. We talked ah. about a lot of different stuff, but yeah, man, I really appreciate you coming on. And like, uh, bro, uh, Brett mentioned that Brooks course, the, the, um, the ad buying, we don't know what it's called actually now. So we're I'll testing. Say, we're actually literally we're testing, actually testing right now to figure out what <laughs> yeah. the title is, what the messaging is for that course. Um, but I think at its, at its core, the idea is what lessons can creatives learn from an ad buying perspective, right? And I think, yeah. again, it's just taking an outside perspective that sometimes maybe doesn't get considered in your own company. And how do you use the the amazing brain power and, and learnings of other people to help inform your creative and how can that make it be more successful? But yeah, we'll let you know. You'll see what the uh, what the title see, of it is and all that. Yeah, we're launching it soon. But I think that if, if, you, if you're listening to this podcast and you think this is interesting, I think this is probably one of the, like we haven't done a course in a, in a, in a hot minute, mm -hmm. but I think this is one of those things where we're seeing this just still ring so true now that it was, you know, 10 years ago when we really started doing this type of thing that we're like, these are like almost immutable laws of marketing that we need to like share with our HBU students and share with those people who are really struggling to get some traction for their creative and ad buying. Um, so if this is something like what we talked about today is something that interests you, you should definitely check it out. It's going to launch very, very soon. TBD, but keep checking out. Um, and so you can subscribe to the Harm Brothers University email list if you want to get updates about when that comes out. And just as a little bit of a teaser, so on that test that we're running that we just mentioned, initial results show that one of our one of our titles for that um, gets a 15% click-through rate and the other gets a 9% click-through rate. Now, the difference between 15 and 9% is 50%. It's a 50% difference in <laughs> click-through rate, okay? So this is just like, again, pounding the pulpit around why it's so important to test. If you could have 50% better 
metrics would you spend i don't know how much we spent on that test thousand bucks or something like that maybe yeah maybe less than that total maybe 500 bucks yeah. i don't know um but it could like wouldn't you spend that money to get that kind of information and that's that's what we're finding so uh again 100%. no brainer and super excited for you guys to check out that course and brooke is the best of the best i mean experience at Harmon brothers back in new york at ad agencies out there running her own businesses um she's amazing so be excited for you guys to check that out yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brett. I really appreciate the time. And uh, until next time. All right. Take care, Shane. Thanks, man. See ya. Bye. Thank you for watching Raising Unicorns. Subscribe now.